Hello everyone. In the earlier modules, we learned how the male and female gametes are formed. The next sporophytic generation starts when the male and female gametes unite to form a zygote. For doing this, the pollen is brought in contact with the stigma through various pollination mechanisms. The pollen germinates to form a pollen tube containing two sperm cells. The pollen tube grows through the style into the ovary and transfers the sperm cells to the egg cell and the central cell within the female gametophyte. A characteristic feature of angiosperms is the process of double fertilization in which the egg sperm fusion forms the zygote and the central cell sperm fusion forms the endosperm. Both processes are important for the success of sexual reproduction. After fertilization, the ovary develops into a fruit, which is an important agency for seed dispersal. In this module, we shall study the processes of pollination, fertilization, and fruit formation, mainly in context of Arabidopsis. The learning objectives of this module are to see how the plants prevent inbreeding by exhibiting self-incompatibility, to understand the nature of pollen pistil interactions through the stigma, style, and ovule to bring about fertilization of the male and female gametes. And finally, we will see how the fruit develops after fertilization is carried out. Transfer of pollen to the stigma is brought about through the process of pollination. In self-pollinated plant species, pollen from the same flower is transferred to the stigma of the same flower, while in cross-pollinated species, pollen is delivered from the flower on one plant to the stigma of a flower on another plant of the same species. Unlike cross-pollination, which ensures genetic variation and hybrid vigor in the progeny, Self-pollination limits the genetic variation and may cause inbreeding depression. However, since self-pollination does not require pollinators, it enables plants to spread beyond the range of pollinator presence and without spending resources to attract pollinators. Hence, plants may show both pollination strategies. However, Cross-pollinated plants have been seen to diversify at a higher rate than those that show self-pollination, providing evidence for a strong species selection towards self-incompatibility. Let us see how self-incompatibility is expressed in plants. Before we come to self-incompatibility, let us see another method by which plants avoid self-pollination. Unisexual plants bear male and female reproductive organs in different flowers on the same plant or on different individuals. The male plants are called the staminate flowers and the female flowers are called the pistillate flowers. Many unisexual plant species, however, show rudiments of opposite sex structures in their flowers, which suggests a recent evolution of unisexual flowers. However, successful reproduction in unisexual plants requires close proximity of plants of both sexes, which may not always be possible. In bisexual flowers, self-incompatibility may be expressed as a spatial separation of anthers and stigma within the hermaphrodite or bisexual flower. Thrum plants have short styles and long stamens with anthers reaching above the stigma. The other type, that is the pin plants, have long styles and short stamens with anthers located below the stigma. The control of this heteromorphy of the stamens and pistil is genetically controlled by a locus called the S locus, which shows highly polymorphic alleles. Thrum plants are heterozygous, that is, with capital S and small s alleles of the S locus, and pin plants are homozygous recessive, that is, small s and small s of the S alleles. 
reciprocal crosses between the two forms are required for fertilization and crosses within the same forms are incompatible on cross pollination a frequency of 50% each of pin and trum plants is maintained in a wild population in heteromorphic self incompatibility the s allele control both the incompatibility phenotype as well as the length of pistil and stamens in plants showing homomorphic self incompatibility there is no heteromorphy within the reproductive organs of the flower but yet the flowers express self incompatibility this type of self incompatibility is also controlled by the s locus and the various s alleles show codominance the inheritance pattern of self incompatibility in gametophytic self incompatibility is controlled by the allelic composition of the interacting gametophyte and the sporophyte hence the s1 or s2 pollen will not be compatible to a pistil having a genotype s1 s2 since it has the same alleles as either of the pollen types however an s3 pollen will be compatible and show pollen tube growth and fertilization the molecular mechanism in gametophytic self incompatibility which has been studied in nicotiana consists of an s allele specific s rnas which is expressed in the extracellular matrix of the style of the female parent and an s specific f box protein called slf protein which is expressed in the pollen tube the srnases are taken up into the pollen tube in a non specific manner no interaction occurs between the self s determinants and this results in pollen tube rna degradation by the s rnas leading to an expression of self incompatibility caused by failure of pollen tube growth however in a non self situation the slf interacts with the non self s rnas and brings about ubiquitin mediated proteasomal degradation of the s rnas this allows the compatible pollen tubes to grow within the style and leads to successful fertilization in sporophytic si systems or self incompatibility systems which is seen in brassica species the genotype of the diploid male parent and not that of the pollen which is a gametophyte plays a role in the expression of self incompatibility the s locus includes two tightly linked genes that form the s haplotype which is inherited as a single mendelian locus the two genes in the s locus are the s locus receptor kinase or the srk gene and the s locus cysteine rich protein or the scr gene the female determinant is the kinase that is the srk which is located in the stigma scr which is the male determinant is located in the pollen coat and is of tapetum origin that is it is of diploid origin the s alleles may show dominance during the expression of sporophytic self incompatibility unlike in gametophytic self incompatibility where the s alleles are codominant when s1 is dominant over s2 the dominant transcripts of s1 scr are expressed in the pollen of an s1 s2 plant but not the s2 scr transcripts indicating that the dominance recessive traits are regulated at the transcript level in pollen the srk gene is expressed in the stigma papillar cells and encodes a plasma membrane localized receptor kinase SCR is expressed in tapetal cells of the anthers and its translational products are secreted to the pollen coat from the tapetum 
It is a small peptide around 60 amino acid long and functions as a ligand for the SRK. During self pollination, the stigma localized SRK inter interacts with the SCR of the same S haplotype located on the pollen surface and activates a self incompatibility signaling cascade. This results in inhibition of the self pollen germination at the stigma papillae. Now, how does this come about? There is another protein kinase called the M locus protein kinase or MLPK which has been identified in self incompatible plants. This kinase, the MLPK, interacts with SRK at the plasma membrane and the interaction is independent of the SCR peptide. Hence, the MLPK SRK heterooligomer forms at the plasma membrane and MLPK is phosphorylated by SRK. Further downstream is an arm repeat containing protein called ARC1, which is a positive regulator of the SRK mediated signaling cascade. ARC1 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase and is phosphorylated by the SRK MLPK complex. The activated ARC1 ubiquitinates a subunit of the exocyst complex component called EXO70A1 which is involved in vesicular trafficking to the plasma membrane and degrades it. This results in inhibition of pollen germination in self-pollinated stigmas. Coming to, in, coming to the other type of interaction that is compatible interactions, in such interactions, thioridoxin H-like proteins called THL1 and THL2 interact with the S receptor kinase and suppress its phosphorylation activity, thus inhibiting further signal transduction for the self-incompatibility expression. Hence, thyroidoxin-like proteins function as inhibitors of SRK-mediated signaling and bring about a compatible pollen stigma interaction. Let us now see what happens in a compatible interaction of the pollen and stigma. A large number of different pollen grains may land on the stigma of which only the compatible pollen germinates. After adhering to the stigma, the pollen hydrates and germinates to form a pollen tube that grows into the transmitting tract of the style. In absence of pollen, the stigma has a high level of reactive oxygen species which inhibit the process of pollen hydration. A signaling cascade involving two receptor-like kinases, angia and feronia, maintain these ROS levels on the stigmatic papillae. ROS generation is brought about by binding of the ligands rapid alkalinization factors or RALFs which bind to the stigmatic receptor like kinases to activate an NADPH oxidase pathway for ROS production. RALFs are secreted by the papillar cells of the stigma. When pollen lands on the stigma, the pollen coat protein Bs or the PCPBs competitively bind to these receptor like kinases and replace RALFs thus shutting down ROS production. In wet stigmas, the water present in the stigmatic exudates carries out the passive hydration of the pollen. However, Arabidopsis has a dry stigma with long papillar cells covered with a continuous layer of cuticle. In this case, the S locus glycoproteins on the stigmatic surface interact with the pollen to facilitate the pro process of addition 
but hydration is carried out by another signaling pathway. In response to pollen addition, a calcium dependent ATPase is activated in the papillar cells, which in turn activates two other receptor like kinases called receptor like kinases in flowers or RFKs. The ligands for these kinases have not yet been discovered. But binding of the ligands to these kinases initiate water release for pollen hydration. Now the exo 70 a vesicular trafficking protein which we saw in the context of self incompatibility locates aquaporin transporters or PIPs to the plasma membrane of the stigmatic cells. This brings about water exudation through the aquaporins and leads to hydration and germination of the pollen. Subsequently, serine esterases present in the pollen along with the esterases on the stigma surface form a cutinase complex which causes the breakdown of the cuticle and penetration of the pollen tube into the stigmatic tissue and its entry into the transmitting tract. Directing the pollen tube from germinating pollen to the transmitting tract is carried out by plantar cyanins, which belong to the phytocyanin family of blue copper proteins. These proteins are present in the extracellular matrix of the style. In the style, two receptor-like kinases, the somatic embryogenesis receptor kinase 1 or the SERK1, and brassinolide associated receptor kinase 1 or the BAC1 support growth of the pollen tubes through the transmitting tract. Pistils from uh, CERC1 BAC1 double mutants show pollen hydration, but the growth of the tubes is affected. These kinases function as co receptors with other receptor kinases. They play a role in receiving extracellular signals and transmitting them to the cell for downstream signaling cascades mediated through the MAP kinase pathways. They play a role in different processes during plant development and also during the expression of immunity responses. The entire male germination unit enters the pollen tube with the vegetative nucleus in the leading position and the two sperm cells moving behind it as passive cargo. The pollen tube growth rapidly by the actin myosin based tip growth mechanism that transports vesicle loaded with new cell wall material to the extending apex. The polarized cytoplasm of pollen tubes is divided into several structurally distinct zones, namely the apical zone, the subapical zone, and the shank zone. Growth of the pollen tubes is fine tuned by cell wall loosening and cell wall biosynthesis processes. At the tip is a vacuolated region where callose is deposited. The cell wall in this region is flexible since it is mainly composed of highly esterified pectins which are synthesized in the Golgi apparatus and secreted by exocytosis. Below the tip is the subapical region that is rich in cell organelles and also has a cell wall of esterified pectins. Behind the subapical region is the shank region containing the sperm cells and vegetative nucleus. The cell wall in this region is made rigid by de-esterification of pectins carried out by the pectin methylesterases. The polarized tip growth of pollen is very rapid with growth rates up to 100 nanometers per second. This rapid growth rate is regulated by several factors of which the rho related GTPases from plants or the ROPs play a key role. ROPs are located in the tip of the pollen tube. They interact with effectors to activate 
multiple downstream pathways for regulating F actin assembly and inducing the transport of vesicles to the tip region. ROPs also promote tip F actin disassembly by regulating calcium dynamics, thus facilitating the fusion of the exocytic vesicles to the plasma membrane at the tip of the pollen tubes. Along with exocytosis, endocytosis is important for pollen tubes to retrieve excess cell wall materials and in recycling of membrane proteins. This is carried out by clathrin coated vesicles. After internalization, molecules move through the endosomes to be recycled back to the cell surface or degraded in the nuclear in the vacuole. Sorry. The extracellular matrix of the transmitting tract supports pollen tube growth, which then emerges from the septum surface and enters the micropyle of an unfertilized ovule. This is guided by chemical signaling. The synergids within the embryo sac secrete small species-specific cysteine-rich polypeptides or CRPs, which are components of the innate immune system in plants. In Arabidopsis, these CRPs are called lure peptides. <laughs> they are secreted through the filiform apparatus and are ligands of the pollen tube expressed receptor like kinase, the pollen specific receptor like kinase 6 or the PRK6. This interaction orients the pollen tube tip to the micropyle through relocalization of the plasma membrane and interactions with the intracellular signaling proteins. Reception of the pollen tube occurs once the pollen tube comes in contact with the receptive synergid cell. Here, the receptor like kinases feronia and angia, which we have seen earlier, present in the synergid, interact with several LALF, RALF ligands secreted by the pollen tube to increase ROS production, which brings about pollen tube rupture and sperm cell discharge. The pollen tube grows around the receptive synergid cell before it enters it and ruptures at the tip. The lure peptides also diffuse to the extracellular matrix, the funiculus the, and septum tissues along which the pollen tubes grow. The species specificity of pollen tube attraction by the lure peptides ensures that the pollen tubes of the correct species will as access the ovules before those of a closely related species. This prevents the chances of interspecific hybridization. The released sperm cell pair from the pollen tube is sandwiched at the interface between the egg and central cell. The cytoplasmic connections to the vegetative cell nucleus are ruptured. A cysteine-rich peptide called egg cell or EC1 present in the storage vesicles of the egg cell is secreted by exocytosis, which is triggered by sperm arrival. EC1 activates the addition factor gamete express 2 present in the sperm cell membrane and this causes sperm attachment to the female gamete membrane. However, fusion is initiated by a surface glycoprotein of the sperm called as generative cell specific GCS1, which is the fusogen. It relocates from the endomembrane compartments to the plasma membrane to initiate fusion of the two cells. After plasmogamy, the sperm nucleus migrates to the female nucleus in an actin dependent manner resulting in nuclear membrane fusion and decondensation of the highly condensed sperm nuclear chromatin into the fused nucleus. Each ovule usually receives only one pollen tube and there are mechanisms that ensure that polyspermy does not occur. If gametic fusion is successful, 
the pollen tube attraction by the synergid ceases because the second synergid called the persistent synergid undergoes cell death and can no longer produce the lure proteins to attract a second pollen tube the synergid cell death is mediated through ethylene signaling in response to the fertilization of the egg similarly the fertilized central cell signals successful fusion of the sperm and central cell through the fertilization independent seed polycomb repressor complex or the fis prc2 proteins however if double fertilization is not completed the persistent synergid is able to receive another pollen tube to complete gametic fusion with the unfertilized egg or central cell this is called fertilization recovery successful fertilization provides the signals that lead to ovary enlargement and the development of a fruit which protects and facilitates dispersal of the fertile seeds in most angiosperms the pistil or even the entire flower senesces and dies if not fertilized in the fruit the ovary walls or integuments form the fruit wall comprising of the pericarp mesocarp and the endocarp within the endocarp lie the fertilized ovules which form seeds arabidopsis develops a dehiscent fruit called silic an embryo originating auxin signal upregulates the biosynthesis of gibberellic acid ga signaling in the ovules and walls stimulates fruit elongation and differentiation of the tissues along the carpal margin meristems in response to ga signaling the cells of the walls and the replum divide along the longitudinal axis contributing to the lengthening of the fruit the silic then undergoes senescence and a transcription factor of the nac family called at nap which is associated with regulating leaf senescence also plays an important role in promoting silic senescence this transcription factor binds to the promoter of a cytokinin oxidase gene atckx3 to bring about degradation of cytokinins which activates senescence at nap expression also brings about an increase in ethylene levels which stimulates respiration in senescing silic along with an induction of senescence the formation of the dehiscence zone is activated the transcription factors like shatterproof fruitful indehiscent replumless which regulate pistil development even before fertilization are involved in further differentiation of the wall margins to form narrow files of lignified cells and a layer of small separation cells which forms the dehiscence zone the separation cell layer defines a longitudinal plane of rupture at both sides of the replum the valve internal layer that is the endocarp is also lignified and when the mature fruit dries it provides mechanical tensions that facilitate pod opening causing the seeds to disperse in indehiscent dry fruits lignification of the ovary tissue occurs but no separation layer forms development of fleshy fruits such as tomato involves cell division and expansion of the ovary tissues but no lignification occurs in tomato cell divisions in the tissues of the valves placenta and septa lead to an increase in the number of cells after which cell expansion progresses and is responsible for the increase in fruit size plant species bearing fleshy fruits show the process of ripening with changes fruit characteristics like color texture aroma and nutritional composition fleshy fruits are of two types climacteric fruits like tomato show a burst of respiration at the onset of ripening along with a large rise in ethylene production 
while in non-climacteric fruits like strawberries or watermelons, abscisic acid has a more important role than ethylene in, during the process of ripening. An important transcription factor that plays a role in ripening process in tomato is a Mads box transcription factor called ripening inhibitor or RIN, which is induced by ethylene. RIN mutants do not ripen at all, indicating the role of RIN as a master regulator of the ripening process. RIN targets a bulk of downstream ripening related genes, including the ethylene biosynthesis and signaling genes, carotenoid synthesis genes, cell wall softening genes, and sugar metabolism genes. Access of RIN to these genes is brought about through an epigenetic mechanism involving demethylation of cytosine in their promoters by Demeter-like DNA demethylases or DMLs. RIN activates ethylene signaling through ethylene insensitive 3 or IN3 to regulate ripening related gene expression. RIN also activates the transcription of an auxin responsive small auxin up RNA or the SOUR, SOUR69, by physically binding to its promoter region. The SOUR69 contributes to the formation of auxin minima in the fruit tissue via the repression of auxin transport and hence signaling. Under low auxin activity or low auxin levels, the sensitivity of the fruit tissue to ethylene is enhanced, which initiates and coordinates the ripening process. On the other hand, RIN also activates the AP2 transcription factor in tomato, which is AP2A, which is a floral meristem identity gene and a negative regulator of several processes involved in ethylene biosynthesis and signaling. Silencing of AP2A causes elevated ethylene production and early fruit ripening. Hence, the dehiscent fruits and the indehiscent fruits show different processes of maturation, ripening, and finally, dehiscence, which leads to seed dispersal. Finally, we conclude this module in which we have seen how the processes of pollination and fertilization are brought about in Arabidopsis. In addition, we have touched upon the process and regulation of fruit development, which starts once successful fertilization occurs. Fruits serve as important role in the dispersal of seeds. Plants often use the services of other organisms in the processes of pollination and seed dispersal for which the plant rewards them with the source of food. These mutually beneficial interactions have played an important role in the co-evolution of angiosperms, their pollinators and the agents of seed dispersal. With this module, we also conclude the paper on plant development. We started this paper with the zygote and have ended it with the formation of the zygote through the process of fertilization. Thank you.